So <clears throat> we're going to give a real brief history of mechanical circulatory support, what I could gather from the Internet without having to do much uh, work in the library. Some of the indications for use, basically it's real sick patients uh, that can't get a transplant or aren't going to get one in time. Some of the devices that we use, our responsibilities currently in use here in Louisville, and what I think are some of the future possibilities of MCS. So everybody pretty much knows what a, a VAD is. Uh, there can be an RVAD, an LVAD, a BIVAD. We can include ECMO as a type of VAD. Total artificial heart is a type of VAD. I think most places are kind of lumping that into mechanical circulatory support nowadays, which kind of puts everything in one group. It, it can include the cath lab, the CVICU, and now I've heard they're doing them and uh, uh, putting people on ECMO in, in museums and things like that. So, so when I look back at kind of a history of, of artificial organs and circulatory assist, one of the first ones that I saw that I found was interesting was in 1915, they used a screen oxygenator to perfuse isolated organs. Then in 1916, as we all know, uh, anticoagulant heparin was discovered, kind of made everybody's job possible. And in 1928, what I want to point out is they relied on a compressible diaphragm to circulate the blood during organ perfusion. And a lot of the early devices and probably some of the ones that may be in the future also use a compressible diaphragm or a blood sack or something like that to propel the blood forward. So that was all the way back in 1928, almost a uh, hundred years ago, and we're still using that, that technology today, although hopefully a little more advanced. And then in 1934, Dr. DeBakey in New Orleans used a dual roller pump for the transfusion of blood. So as we all know, dual roller pumps are in use every day, probably on every heart-lung machine out there. And again, that was back in 1934. In 1937 was the first sighting that I saw that they used an extracorporeal assist device to substitute for cardiac function in a dog, and that was for a little over five hours. In 1952, the first arteriographs made of cloth were described. So I think these were probably the precursors to our alphographs that we use on a lot of our devices now. And then in 1953, uh, John Gibbon in Philadelphia used the first heart-lung machine for cardiac surgery. Again, I can't say that these are exact or there's the only ones, but these are the ones that I found uh, cited in a review article. And in 1954, Lily High used cross-circulation to perform an intracardiac repair. Then in 1955, there was the first meeting of the... Uh, Society for Artificial Internal Organs, and that was in New Jersey with 67 members. In 1956 in Cleveland, they developed the first successful membrane oxygenator, still in use today. In 1957, they used a total artificial heart in a dog, keeping the animal alive for 90 minutes. And then the biggie is in 1957, they came up with kind of a manufacturable, uh, disposable, bubble oxygenator that can be used at, at different sites, not just in big research centers. So that's kind of kind of where our, our profession started, and mechanical circulatory assist started. The first successful implantation of a, an LVAD was in 1966, again by Dr. DeBakey, and this was implanted in a 37-year-old woman. The, the story that I got from that was it was a post-cardiotomy patient. It was a paracorporeal external device. You see the picture of it here. Uh, these are the inflow and outflow, the uh, compressible diaphragm and the pneumatic tube that drove it. She was uh, weaned off of that to the best of my knowledge in about 10 days. Uh, LVAD is Bridge to Recovery in 1966. That was that lady we just talked about. And this blurry uh, diagram here shows the where it was anastomosed to the left atrium and the subclavian artery. Uh, this beauty here was implanted in 1969 by Domingo Liata and Denton Cooley into a patient uh, in Houston. They removed it 64 hours later when a donor heart became available. And if you look at it, to me, this looks like caulk or glue, uh, whatever else they used to, to mash this thing together. These two little nubs here are, I think, de-airing tubes. 
<clears throat> so you look at what they had to work with and their ingenuity enabled to make this device, and it worked. Um, you would not be able to get by with something like that in today's world, but it did work, and the outcome was successful. Oops. Uh, Thortech PVAD, people are probably very familiar with. I don't think they're manufacturing it anymore, and I, I don't think you can get pieces, parts for it, but I know it was a favorite of a lot of surgeons. The device worked great. If you look on the left here, you can see what we used to call the big 500-pound washing machine. It was their dual drive console, um, and this is what powered either a, a LVAD, an RVAD, or a BIVAD, and this shows a BIVAD patient here on the, on the right. <clears throat> We used this for many, many years, and in 1985, I think Dr. Lehman Gray did one of the first uh, successful bridges with a Thoratec BIVAD, PVAD to a heart transplant. Probably wasn't the first, but it was probably one of the first in the early 80s. And Dr. Lehman Gray is how I got my start in mechanical circulatory support. Whether it was good, good news or bad news, he asked me, uh, or pretty much told me, that I was going to start in their VAD program, and, and I've been there ever since. That was in about 1996. Uh, the Jarvik 7, which is one of the things I saw when I was in high school, and one of the things that kind of got me interested in, in medicine and, and surgery, although I didn't find out about perfusion until I'd been working as a respiratory therapist for a couple of years. It was a pulse little pump. They did excise the native heart. And in 1982, Barney Clark was implanted with that as a bridge to transplant. He was supported for 112 days. I think he ended up succumbing to infection or, or stroke. Um, never left the hospital, as far as I know. Or, or he might have been the one that went to, like, an apartment they had for him across the street. The Syncardia today is the modern-day Jarvik 7. So that previous picture was the old-style device. Uh, this is the newer one, looks a little bit more sleek and nice. If you look here, you can see that they have Velcro uh, in the middle there. So they were able to change the relationship of these two pumps according to the PA and aorta in that patient's anatomy. Uh, to my knowledge, they have two sizes available now so that they can fit it into smaller patients. And they also have a, what they call a portable freedom driver so that they can leave the hospital and, and pull their driver behind them. I think it weighs about 25 pounds. The HeartMate XVE was one of the first devices that I used. <clears throat> it was uh, electrically powered. It did have a blood diaphragm that was kind of compressed by a wheel. It's kind of a neat design. But you could hear it. It's big and it was noisy. And it wore out in about a year to a year and a half. So. If you had a patient at that time, I think they were almost all bridges, and our, our wait time was usually about a year to 18 months for our transplant patients at that time. Uh, some of them, could the device could wear out, and they would either have to be replaced or they would have to get a transplant. And you would actually see the dust coming out of the vent tube. And if you wanted to, you could send a sample of that dust to Thoratec, and they would measure the amount of a certain a metal alloy in the dust and tell you if the bearings were actually wearing down. Uh, this is a pictures of the devices that we are using or have used since I've been here in a Jewish hospital here in Louisville. Uh, the Thoratec Centromag we still use sometimes for isolated RVAD support and it is our main pump for our ECMO patients. We did use quite a few of the Thoratec PVADs, great device, worked great. We'd use several of the Thortec IVADs, which was basically their implantable version of the PVAD. Uh, the HeartMate XVE was big for us for several years. We then moved on to the HeartMate 2. We did actually do several of the Aero Lion Hearts, which was a totally implantable LVAD. Uh, if you look, you can see on the, over to the right side, that big round plate, that is a compliance chamber for the air that was shuttled in and out to compress the blood sac. Over on the bottom left, that was the controller slash battery. And up at about 10 o'clock, that was the tech coil where the <clears throat> external power supply was transferred across the skin through that tech coil. We used uh, the Debakey in, in probably less than 20 patients. I think we used several of their, of their designs. Um, they had two links for their outflow graft. And this pump actually started out 
from what I was told, as a NASA fuel pump for the space shuttle, and then they moved it into the medical world. It was the only one at the time, and maybe the only one that I've heard of, that had a true flow meter. It measured a true flow. It wasn't estimated based on speed or power, and that's that white donut-looking <laughs> thing in the middle there. Um, it had They had some issues with their controllers, but other than that, I think it was an okay device. I always got confused when I started out, when I go to talks, and they talked about the generations of VADs. I got this slide from the Heart Assist Company off their website. So their generation one, they're calling those big, large devices, the XVE and the Novacore, which I used when I first got here also. Those would not fit in smaller females or smaller males. Then we moved on to the axial flow pumps that you could put in a, a wider variety of patients, the HeartMate 2 probably being the big one. They're calling the third generation, it's a, the centrifugal flow pumps, your Levacores, uh, your Ventresis, and now your HeartMate 3. And then the generation four is the centrifugal pumps with basically no um, pocket. And I guess you'd have to consider the HeartMate 3 being in that group also. Uh, they gave themselves, I think, their own uh, Generation 5, which is the Heart Assist 5, which is the danger of taking slides from a company. <clears throat> but what I liked in another slide that they had was they showed the size and weight kind of decreasing over the years until now you've got your HVAD and your HeartMate 3 that are probably around, you know, 150 to 180 grams. Uh, the Heart Assist 5, which I've never really seen or used, is they say weighs 92 grams. But you can see the size and shape has decreased over the years. HeartMate 2 has kind of been the, the workhorse for many, many years. A lot of places implant it, and some places only implant that. It works on the Archimedes screw principle, and it has the centered titanium surfaces. So if you remember back in the day, we thought everything had to be ultra smooth so that the blood wouldn't form clots on it. What they came to find out is that if you put this center titanium kind of coating on the surfaces of there, of the device, the body will lay down a layer of epithelial cells and that should make it less thrombogenic. So they took that technology that they had in their, their HeartMate XVE and put it into their newer devices, the HeartMate 2 and the HeartMate 3 devices. I think the last count I, I saw was 20,000 patients or more had been implanted with the HeartMate 2 all across the world. The Heartware HVAD, which we've been using since probably 2009, 2010, their initial uh, clinical trial, is a, is a good device also. It's a centrifugal pump. The newer ones now, a lot of them are moving to integrated or integral inflow cannulas or conduits that are integrated into the pump. What I want you to notice on this one is this a picture of the old device uh, where that inflow portion was smooth. It's now got that rough surface to kind of promote the tissue ingrowth and the uh, layering down of that epithelial layer of cells. Uh, something that's kind of near and dear to my heart is the Abiacor, not around anymore as far as I know, but there was a lot of research done on it in Houston and in Louisville uh, to get this implanted in patients. Uh, it's a total replacement heart. It was totally implantable. It had an internal battery, an internal controller. Um, the internal battery, I think, at that point would last 30 minutes to an hour where they could go totally untethered, swimming, take a shower, do whatever they wanted to do. It was a very complex device, um, probably one of the most complex devices for its time. And we did about uh, 50 or 55 uh, animal implants, large animal implants here in Louisville at our research institute. And our surgeon decided that he wanted the same team involved in the animal research as he did in the humans. So when we started doing these large animals, mostly cows, he brought over the scrub nurse, the circulating nurse, uh, the surgeons, two surgeons, two perfusionists. So the same team that did those 50 or 60 cows uh, was the same team that went across the road and did uh, those seven patients that we did in Louisville. So it was kind of a neat thing. It wasn't lab, lab people doing the surgery. It was actual human clinical people. So we had a lot of experience uh, putting this device in before we did our first patient. First patient, I think, was done on July 2nd, 2001. 
Uh, he lived six months. I don't think he ever left the hospital. Uh, part of the reason is is when they first the FDA first allowed them to do these implants, the patients had to be very very ill, even more ill than probably they would for a normal LVAD. So we were fighting a losing battle pretty much from the beginning, <clears throat> in that they had a lot of times what ended up being irreversible end organ failures. So a lot of them didn't do that well. The patient that lived the longest, to my knowledge, was a patient that was implanted here in Louisville. He lived about 18 months, probably uh, 12 or 13 or 14 of those months was at home. He got to go to weddings. I think he celebrated one or two Christmases and a lot of grandkids um, events while he was on that device. Uh, eventually, after about 17 or 18 months, those blood sacs in there kind of started to stretch. And when they stretched, they started to impinge on the motor or the valves inside of the device. And the company was aware of this, and they must have uh, informed the patient that his device was heading for failure. And rather than having his device implanted or re-implanted, he decided that he, he'd had a a good long time on it. He would got to do some of the things he wanted to do. So he opted to come into the hospital, uh, have a nice lunch with his family, and just let the batteries run down. So he got to kind of choose the end, uh, how it happened. It, his pump just didn't just seize up at home while he was playing with his grandkids. So it was very sad, but, but very well controlled, and, um, and it was uh, nice for him and his family. Um, so this is a little bit about, about the patients. Uh, Dr. Lehman Gray and Robert Dowling did the first one in 2001. Um, it was an incredible effort. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't pan out, but we, we learned a lot from that, and I think other companies have learned a lot from that also. The HeartMate 3 is the one we, we've started using for a couple years now. It's a centrifugal, magnetically levitated pump. And the HeartMate 3 and the Heartware both have <clears throat> artificial pulse modes built in, which is a little bit of a misnomer. It doesn't generate a pulse that you can feel. It generates what they're calling almost a micro pulse, where it speeds up and slows down uh, so many times during a minute for a certain period of time. What they hope will happen is that it might help with some of that microcirculation issues that people get in their guts as far as the von Willenbrand factor deficiency and, and the AVMs and GI bleeds that these patients sometimes develop. So why do we need them? Uh, millions of Americans suffer with heart failure, and these are, are statistics from 2013, so it's probably more than that now. The cost is the big thing. These patients are in and out of the hospital uh, for many days at a time, five, six, seven times a year. Excuse me. Their quality of life is not great when they're home, and medical management doesn't fix all of them. So end-stage heart failure is a chronic terminal disease, and what do we do when medical management no longer is working? <clears throat> we try and put VADs in them. In Louisville, we've been doing VADs here since, like I said, the mid-80s. They've been doing research on VADs at our, our research institute probably that same amount of time. So companies will come here and they will uh, have part of their development and, and animal testing done, done here in Louisville because we do have a large uh, animal lab. We've implanted over 10 different types of devices that I can count and remember and think about. I've noticed over the 25 years I've been doing this that the size is considerably reduced, but what's even more important is the durability and overall functions has increased considerably increased and improved so we can put them in more patients, smaller patients, and they're pretty much plug and play. And the patients don't really have to do much with them at home and they're pretty much trouble free for the most part. So our team here, again, it all started with our cardiac surgeons uh, back in the 80s and has continued on. Uh, our main uh, LVAD surgeon now is Dr. Mark Slaughter who came to us from uh, Advocate Christ, I think in 2008 or 2009. He's heavily involved in research and trying new devices and and putting patients on on support. We have a team of heart failure cardiologists, but again, a lot of it is is perfusion different, which is not rare, but I don't think it's the norm. So, uh, like I said, I think programs start when they start. They kind of choose who they want to do what, 
and for whatever reason, our surgeons were very pro-perfusion. Uh, they had a lot of faith and trust in their perfusionist, and they felt with their training and background, they were the perfect people to learn these devices and take care of them from, from beginning to end. So we have a team of five perfusionists that are our core VAD team that does most of the VAD work and MCS work at our hospital. We have a total of nine perfusionists plus one dedicated peds perfusionist, but <clears throat> the five of us are, are trained and uh, extra trained and take care of these patients every day. Pretty much almost anybody in our hospital can come in contact with a VAD patient. I think now we have about 120 on support, and most of them are home now. I think our inpatient population now is seven or eight, and that varies per week. Our VAD nursing coordinators are great. They are our, VAD, our gatekeepers. They manage more of the medical side of it. We manage more of the technical alarm equipment side of it, but all the calls go through them, and then they decide who needs to be called to help take care of that patient after that. We have nurse practitioners that are both working in the surgical part and the heart failure part. And again, you see all those other people listed down there. We meet every week <clears throat> to discuss patients that we're gonna implant or patients that we've already implanted to decide what the next course of treatment is. So our duties here at the hospital, we have directors of both the ECMO and, and the VAD programs. For ECMO, we do the initiation, the decannulation, 24 hour alarm and troubleshooting maintenance, ordering, and tracking of the equipment. We do sit ECMO for the first six to eight hours and PRN after that. We round on them twice daily <clears throat> during the week and once on the weekends. Uh, we consult for the cannulation, parameter, and, and weaning. We do all the training and competency evaluation of all the staff and usually anything else they can think of. So one of the ways we've been able to, I think, get away from the bedside, and this is a discussion that probably take a lot longer, um, to talk about as far as our ECMO program, but we spend a lot of time and resources training our CVICU nurses. We retrain them several times a year. Uh, and also we have a very simple setup, which makes it, if they don't pull it out, uh, there's probably not a lot they can do to, um, to compromise the system. As far as the MCS, we're involved in the, from the beginning to the end, uh, with new devices, old devices. We do all the device prep and console management in the OR. Uh, we transport all the MCM, MCS patients throughout the hospital if they need to go for a procedure. One of our main duties is keeping us certified with uh, J, JCO. We do the, our chief does the documentation, keeps up with the compliance and preparation for our, our audits also. Um, is it not going forward? Okay. All right, uh, <clears throat> we also educate all the staff. That includes the physicians, nursing, ancillary staff. We train pre-op, post-op. Um, we train the nurses on the floor. We do education for our PTOT departments. Pretty much anyone that comes in contact with a VAD, Perfusion has some role in helping to train them. Um, we also do the yearly nursing competencies along with our VAD coordinators. We provide education updates. We also go out into the field to train first responders, uh, dialysis centers, short-term, uh, long-term care facilities. And again, we do the device tracking and equipment change outs. So everything, everybody knows how LVAD works. It has a controller that's usually powered by two batteries or a battery and an AC adapter. These are just the, the hardware two and, or the HeartMate two and three controllers. Uh, the types that we have right now, for the most part, these are the, the three or the two or the three main ones that are non-pulsatile. Most of the total artificial hearts that are being developed, I think, are going to be pulsatile devices, but that I'm not sure about. So they all have a speed that's set by the surgeon or the cardi or cardiologist. The flow is almost always estimated, and we measure the power in watts. For the most part, they're all anticoagulated at our program. Most of them are worked up to a full aspirin a day. Every now and again, we add platelet inhibitors. Coumadin is the main drug for the INR goal of two to three. That's flexible depending on the device and the patient. And pharmacy helps us with dosing that in the hospital. 
and the vet coordinators and cardiologists kind of dose it when they're at home. Some of them have home INR machines, and we monitor it that way. Every now and again, due to recurrent GI or nosebleeds, we have to markedly decrease <clears throat> or discontinue anticoagulation, but we don't like doing that. You're kind of uh, playing with fire there. External VAT equipment, just some pictures, if you're not familiar with it, of the hardware on the right and the heart mates on the left. Now, the ugly part is the drive line. It's one of the things I think we need to get rid of if we're going to be really comparable to uh, transplant in the future, because drive line infection can really uh, take a patient and knock them down and keep them in the hospital. So we try and fix our drive lines in two spots, once where it exits the body and once again a little further away. So if they do drop the controller, these anchors or tape will take that strain and it won't tug on the actual exit site itself. Our coordinators kind of score the drive line exit site, one, two, three, and four. That way everybody's kind of talking the same language when you're describing uh, what their exit site looks like. And we try to get to them and treat them when they're at a one or a two. Once they start getting down to the three and the four, uh, then you're talking multiple driveline debridements, long-term antibiotics, and, and eventually the infection will probably uh, take them. So I don't think I look anything like this guy on the right, but uh, one of my lovely coworkers sent me these two pictures together and, and thought that I should use them for my profile picture. But I know I don't pull my pants up that high. <laughs> so complications with, uh, with uh, LVADs, uh, bleeding, thrombosis, hopefully not neurologic dysfunction or infection. Hemolysis can still be an issue from time to time. Device failure is really fortunately fairly rare. What is a little bit more common is worsening right heart failure and aortic valve insufficiency, which I think is just a part of their natural disease progression over time. Uh, but we try to keep an eye on that and minimize it when we can. So what do I think the future of it is? Total artificial heart, certainly. Uh, transcutaneous NHG transfer or charging or powering the VAT across the skin. That technology has been around for a long, long time. It is just not translated into VADs right now very much. Totally art totally implantable artificial hearts and totally implantable LVAD and RVAD systems uh, where we don't have a drive line is going to be the next big thing. <clears throat> um, there's companies I'm sure that are working on it. To be able to do that, I think we have to have long life implantable batteries. The ones that I've used in the past would last about a half an hour and needed to be replaced fairly simply after about a, every six months to a year, probably about a year. Systems need to be durable. We need to make them last 10 years or more so that they can be comparable to a heart transplant. If we improve the blood contacting services, that'll allow us to limit or uh, get rid of anticoagulation, which would be great for a lot of these patients. There are some minimally invasive surgical implant techniques out there, but we need to make those more widespread and transfer them into some of the different devices to make it the surgeries a little bit simpler and a little less invasive. So I went to look to see what devices were being developed out there. And again, you can't find a lot of information because they're trying to keep their technology secret. But both of these to me look like they are biventricular support, uh, the real heart and the bivacore. The CARMAT has been implanted in patients in Europe. I've heard rumors that it, they are going to start a US trial. I don't know when. I've also heard rumors that Louisville will be one of their uh, clinical sites, but that's all unsubstantiated rumors at this point. I like these two pictures because they're both small biventricular support devices. And this one, if we look on the uh, bottom left, that to me looks like a small tech coil. So this one looks like it's an implantable, totally implantable device. So what's it going to take? A lot, a lot of money. It's going to take some time, and the companies have to commercially commit in order to bring these devices to the patients. we got to get a little bit lucky, and the FDA has to be able to um, be a little bit more, uh, how am I going to put this? It's got to be a little bit faster and a little bit cheaper to bring these to market, and the FDA has a lot to do with it, 
but they have to be able to do that quicker and cheaper without compromising patient care. And I'm not sure I have the answer to that. So I like this first quote, just because we can doesn't mean we should, and that translates to everything in medicine, ECMO, VADs. You could put a VAD or an ECMO on anybody, and you can probably keep them alive, but it's not always the best thing for that patient. Sometimes we need to look at the end goal and see if we can get there with what we have. Dr. Bud Frazier uh, mentioned this in a talk of his. I don't know if it's his for sure, this quote, but success has many fathers, but failure is always a bastard. Uh, we always want to take credit. Everybody wants to take credit when things go well, but nobody wants to be in the room when things go poorly. And I think you have to kind of do both. This is my quote. There is a noticeable difference between engineering science and medical art. I thought about that when I was trying to talk to the engineers at the VAD company that I worked for, and everything with them was black and white, and I don't think uh, medicine is really all that black and white. There's some, some art and some nuance to it, and especially when it comes to taking care of uh, a VAD and ECMO patients. There's not algorithms for everything with these patients. So, thank you.